Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for waiting. We'll give it a few seconds to allow everybody to join. I think we should be okay now. Well, welcome to the latest series of AirCover. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, AirCover is an informative, international, inspiring webinar series by Global University Systems that brings to you some of the world-leading world -lead, world businesses and business leaders across the globe. Our topic today is Stepping Stones to Success, where we'll be discussing key insights into how to succeed in your field. The guest that I'm about to introduce has been ranked in the category of Associates to Watch in 2021 by pa Chamber and Palmer's. Uh, Chamber and Partners, and has been highlighted as a rising star for reputation management in Legal 500 in 2020. Please join me in welcoming Helena Shipman, Senior Associate at Carterac and one of the UK's largest law firms. Hello, Helena, how are you doing? Very well, thanks. Nice to be here. Helena, thank you for joining us today and taking the time to speak to our staff and students. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here and we're very excited. And just before we start, we have a tradition at Aircover uh, Gus places a lot of importance on its company values, and I would like to speak to you about one of those values and hear what your thoughts are on communication. What does communication mean to you? Well, as a lawyer, communication is completely essential at all stages of your career. Um, when you begin as a paralegal or as a trainee, you're going to be pulled in all sorts of directions by all sorts of people. And it's really important that you learn very, very quickly to communicate, you know, have you got their email? Are you progressing their email? Do you think you'll be able to do it in the time frame that they've asked for? Um, it's the easiest way to impress the people who are senior to you and to you know, move on to the next stage. And once you get a bit more senior, you will then start at being the person responsible for communicating with the client or with barristers or with other people involved in the case. And so in my line of work particularly, that will include people like PR agents or other lawyers who are advising on specialist aspects of the law, for example, you know, criminal law or something. Uh, and being able to concisely report information um, to any of those people is invaluable. And also you'll find that, you know, as you become more responsible for dealing with clients, that um, you're often not just playing the role of a lawyer, you're also their advisor and sometimes even their therapist. <laughs> um, so, you know, you, you've got to be able to intuit what, what they need at that, at that particular time and, you know, be able to communicate accordingly with them. And I think finally, what I would say about communication is that it is, really really important to be able to communicate with the people that you work with uh, your professional needs your desires and also even your limits you know you know I'm, I'm sorry I've actually just I've, I've done too much I can't do any more now um, and you know being able to have a conversation about for example you know areas that you think as a trainee that you need more experience in or alternatively your career prospects um, all of that kind of feeds into not just having a career that you're managing, but one that you're actually really enjoying. And I think it will make, it makes all the difference. Thank you, Helena. What an amazing way to describe communication. I mean, on so many levels. Um, to our viewers, thank uh, a quick uh, note to all of you. Do some questions for Helena in the chat box. You can start sending them right away. You don't have to wait till the end. Uh, and we'll filter through them and answer them to you at the end during the Q&A session. So Helena, let's dive straight in. Um, you have had a very impressive career working in the legal field. I'm sure our university students and particularly those studying in the legal field watching this webinar would be interested to know how you got to where you are today. Can you tell us how you went from studying the history of arts at the university to becoming a qualified solicitor? Yes, of course. So I, I, as you said, started doing history of art, which I absolutely loved, really enjoyed and, and for a while thought I might go into. Um, unfortunately, I graduated uh, a couple of years after the 2008 financial crash, and, and the reality was that there just weren't any jobs in the market. 
um, in, in the field that I wanted to go into. And as I, I think may be the case with many lawyers that you meet, you know, my father was a lawyer and I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll try the LPC. If you know, worst comes to the worst, it will be an extra string to my bow at the end of the year. Uh, and so I did it. And um, while I was doing the LPC, I got some work experience set up at the firm that I am at now, Carter Ruck. Um, and I did a week there. And to be honest, the first couple of days I wasn't sure. And then I was given a really interesting project to work on, which is a research project. And that kind of ignited a, a little spark. And I was like, OK, you know, maybe this is something that I could be interested in. And in the meantime, I had moved on to doing some uh, working in mental health because I got a contemporary job in there, which I think actually equipped me rather well in law, being able to speak to all sorts of people. Um, but I decided that, you know, at this crossroads in my life where I was thinking about maybe pursuing mental health or maybe st sticking with law, I would go back to Carter Ruck and I would ask for a second week of work experience to just really test it out. And I loved it. A couple of months later, they had a paralegal opening. So I interviewed and thankfully I got the job and the rest is really history. I, I've been here ever since. It's amazing. I mean, I, I know I can imagine lots of students relating to this because they start with a course, they're unsure which which way to, which path to take, and also students who have also done a degree and then taking a different career path. It's quite interesting. Do you do you miss um, working in the field of of, um, of history? I mean, the history of arts that you've studied. I well do. I never, I've never worked in history of art in a professional context. I, I was lucky enough to do lots of um, very interesting work experience. So I'm sure had I gone down that path, you know, I would have got a, lo a lot of um, satisfaction and value out of it. And um, what I think what I would say is that the value of doing another subject, um, and you know, that, that's not to say that there is no benefit in just doing straight law at university, which I know many, many people do, including my own brother. Um, but uh, the value was that I, I had learned another subject, which I then could become an interest and a hobby, which I could carry on with me, you know, for the rest of my life, uh, which would be, you know, also my professional world. Um, so I feel like I'm very lucky and I've got the benefit of both. Thank you, Lena. So you've worked for Carterac since 2012. Now, just under 10 years later, Legal 500 claim you have the ability to drag a better offer out of the other side than anybody else thought possible. Can you talk us through some of the key attributes you needed to succeed in the legal field? Uh, I, I can certainly try. Um, I think I've already talked about one. Communication is key. Um, I think to a certain degree, intelligence is a given. Uh, I, you know, I, Maybe I'm naive, but I think if you're clever enough to do a law degree or, or any degree, then you, you've got enough intelligence to have what it takes as a lawyer. Um, I think you need to be flexible. And the, what I mean by that is particularly in the field of litigation, which is what Carter Ruck specialise in, um, you have to be ready to adapt at a minute's notice. You know, you you might think, you know, you're packing up for the day at 5.30 on a Friday, looking forward to your weekend plans, and then an injunction will hit. And you're like, okay, well, you know, ev everything is just wiped and we've, we've just got to do this now. And, you know, luckily I'm interested in my, you know, this area and I love my job. And, you know, that's, that's something that I get a kick out of. It's not for everyone. Um, but, you know, for, I think, although all the areas of law are very different you are going to have you know, these kind of um, tensions and pulls on your time and, and you just need to be able to to roll with it um i'd also say attention to detail which i know sounds incredibly boring but, but it is incredibly important and you know often or if not always the devil is in the detail in what we do and it really can make all the difference you know a case can turn on a point we have all these horror stories that you'll read about um not i should add at my firm um but but you know the the kind of uh, a 
trainee who was asked to send a client a check um, or, or a bank transfer and put the wrong digit in the account number and then, you know, £100,000 or whatever it was got sent to the wrong place. Oh. So it is really, really important. <laughs> um, I, I guess the last one is I think you need to be um, interested, uh, so, you know, eager to learn and teachable. Um, I think the, the mistake a, a lot of people make is thinking that to impress, they need to show that or need to appear like they already know the answer. When actually, that those are the kind of people that alarm me because I'm like, well, you're more likely to get it wrong. You know, I want you to. If you don't know the answer, you must come and ask. Um, you know, m most of the time, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Of that answer. <laughs> You specialise in reputation, media and privacy disputes in the legal sector. How did you end up in specialising in this part of the law? Was it a decision that you made at the start of your career? So uh, as you may have gleaned from my story about how I got into law, it certainly wasn't a decision I made early on. I, I, I kind of landed in it and I'm very fortunate to have done that because I've never looked back. Uh, what I would say is now I think it's a lot harder um, I am involved in the recruitment of paralegals and trainees at the firm and I think this has been a trend since before I went into law it's been getting progressively harder over the last few decades but now when I get a CV I look at it and I think you know, I expect everybody to have a 2-1 or above. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, the reality is that unless there are exceptional circumstances, if you haven't got that, it's going to be difficult for you. Maybe not impossible, but difficult. Mm. Um, so what I'm looking for is someone to demonstrate to me why they're interested in media law, uh, why they're interested in Carter Ruck. And the way you can do that is, you know, by either having done lots of work experience uh, by um, having written articles about specific you know, new aspects of media law, new developments, um, or you know, attending trials or hearings, anything that really marks you out, um, which is, is becoming increasingly important to do. I'm sure this information is particularly important uh, of benefit for our law students. We have got the University of Law, we have got Arden University. Um, so yes, and do, students, do send questions for Helena here in the chat box. Just a gentle reminder, uh, don't wait till the end. Um, Helena, your hard work hasn't gone unnoticed in the past few years. Having received recognition from the world's leading provider of legal research and analysis, Chamber and Partners, who ranked you in the category of associates to watch for 2021. How much of an achievement was this in your career? And is this just a start? Well, it was a, it was a great achievement and it's extremely flattering to be recognized. Um, so I am very proud of it. What uh, is it? Is it just the start? Well, I, I hope so. I mean, I, it's this is something I love to do and, you know, hope to keep doing for a long time to come. As a woman in this industry, I think, you know, we face quite a lot of challenges and, you know, the, the, I think the stats are that it's over 60% of the new intake of lawyers are female, but then when you get to partnership, they, that's a fraction of that are, are female. And I'm very, very lucky to work at a firm where they are extremely supportive of women. In fact, I think the last round of partners that were made up were all female. Um, so I'm, you know, I, I've got all the the the, the, the stepping stones um, that I need, and you know, we'll just have to see where I get to. You have worked on behalf of both claimants and defendants. What are the challenges of working on both sides? So I think for claimants. Uh, the, the challenge can be, you know, also the thrill, um, which, or, or one of the challenges, is um, the pace of it. Um, as I said before, it's not for everyone, and you know, you can it, it can it can be quite cyclical. So sometimes you're not that busy, and then out of nowhere you'll be working all weekend and you know late at night. Uh, and that's partly because we work to journalist deadlines. So, you know, often it'll be Friday night when you get the inquiry from the journalist who's going to publish an article about your client on Sunday. And, you know, you, you've got 
next to no time to put together either you know the court documents necessary to go and get an injunction uh, or to you know get your clients instructions find out what actually happened advise them you know actually is there anything you can do about this or is it you know, something you're just going to have to, to deal with uh, and you know also the, the fallout what, you know, what the strategy might be you know in, in 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 cases where we think well actually maybe although it's not true they've got enough to safely report it because it's in the public interest uh, in which case you know are you going to get pr people lined up all of that i mean it, it's a, a full service a very holistic kind of global view for for the client's issues um i think for defendants uh, one of the the key things that they that you have to do uh, to advise the defendant is you have to be able to assimilate all the instructions and what I mean by is that all the facts and all the evidence very quickly at a very early stage um, because you know if, if if your client has published something that they can't back up then you need to know that straight away because you don't want to do in, you know, in six months time where everybody's racked up loads of costs uh, and then you know then you'll have to your client's going to have to pay out an awful lot more okay. so kind of assessing what the merits are very quickly is incredibly important uh, and then having kind of a, a good negotiation strategy is paramount uh, so being able to work out what it is that the claimant really wants and also you know what their bottom line is because you don't want to necessarily pay them more than you have to <laughs> In your career, you have worked on multiple cases with six-figure settlements. Can you tell us what methods you use to deal with the pressure of working on cases of this magnitude? So having a good team is obviously crucial. Um, you've all got different roles. In a firm of my size, we'll have a, a partner. You'll have either one or two associates. So I'm a senior associate and sometimes I'll be working with a junior associate depending on how big the case is. But you know, in, in one of that size, you would expect to be, all be working um, on that. And then you'll have a trainee and you've all got different areas and different responsibilities. Uh, so it is, again, sorry to bang on about it, but communication um, is very, very important and organization. Um, in a case of this size, you're going to have court deadlines, you're going to have various letters, you know, things that you have to respond to, things that you have to keep on top of. You'll, you may, may be getting, you know, hundreds of documents from the client in that need to be reviewed, put in a sensible order, sent to the barrister. And it's all got to be managed in a sensible way so that everybody kind of knows where everything is, knows that everyone's read anything, nothing's going to get missed. Um, I think, I guess the other one is um, strategy. And I think that's something you learn, what well, is something you learn, the more senior you get. As a trainee, you're not going to be asked to run a case on your own without any experience. Um, you, you know, I'm sure you'll be asked for your views and they you know, may well be, it's, it's always useful to get insight from somebody who's come at it fresh. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, having somebody, you know, partner who's got an overview of all the arc of the case and what it, where it's more likely to end up, uh, that that only comes with experience, um, but is obviously absolutely crucial to to being able to get to where you want to go. One of the most high-profile cases in the past twelve months was the judgment of Johnny Depp versus News Group Newspapers Limited. You made an appearance as a legal expert on Sky News, as well as being interviewed by international corporations. Can you tell us about this experience? Yes, it was absolutely terrifying, um, <laughs> but it was also incredibly rewarding. Um, it was my first uh, live interview, uh, yeah. which hopefully I've improved on <laughs> since then. Um, Doing amazing. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so I think mean, it was, you know, the the what. What happened on that with that interview was that uh, the the judgment was being handed down, which means it was being made public at 10 a.m. And at about 10.02, I was being interviewed by Sky News outside the Royal Courts of Justice to give my views on the conclusion. And so when I uh, was standing outside and were trying to get on the website, the, the, the court website to download the website, um, the website crashed uh, and then when I finally did manage to get hold of the judgment I, it was um, 
hundred pages or so. Oh God. <laughs> uh, and the conclusions are right at the end. So I was frantically scrolling, trying to get to the bottom of it. But um, it was, I mean, hopefully I said something sensible on it. Um, it was very, uh, my feeling about all these things is, uh, and something that I think applies across industry, not just to law, is that you need to challenge yourself. Um, you know, if, if you are interested in progressing in your career, like, this is maybe a bit of a naff phrase, but lean in, you know, you, you've got to take the opportunities where they present themselves, uh, challenge yourself um, because you're only going to improve if you do more of them. And um, you're only going to know if you're good at it, if you try. Uh, and it, these, yeah, I, I, I think, to get the most out of your career, um, you, you've just got to give it a go um, and you'll find it very rewarding. It's a good piece of advice. I mean, I think most people hold back, isn't it, out of the fear of maybe failing, out of the fear of not being able to deliver. But um, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the worst thing that will happen is that, you know, accidentally, you know, you don't know the answer or, you know, you have to move on quite quickly. Um, but you know, at least you tried, which is more than most. Yeah, that's true. Um, can you give us an insight into what it is like working on cases involving publishing and broadcasting giants in, in the media industry, such as the Daily Mail, BBC, Channel 4? Uh, absolutely. I mean, they say they, they are our usual opponents. And um, so we w working on the claimant side of things, which is probably what I do m more of, the... You, you're dealing with very human emotions you know you're unless you're even well even if you're acting for a company you're still de dealing with individuals within the company and you are um it, more often than not if you're dealing with an individual you're speaking to them you're holding their hand through the litigation you're guiding them and that can be um you know a bit of a roller coaster for them and and sometimes for you when you're going up against the Daily Mail, the BBC and the Channel 4, they, to a certain degree, can represent these kind of faceless corporations, um, which can make it easier from you know, a, a claimant lawyer perspective. I, what, I, what I would say is that there's clearly a, a place for both Article 8 and Article 10. And what I mean by that is kind of the right to privacy versus the right to expression. Uh, and um, I certainly, and I don't think any claimant lawyers, uh, are trying to diminish the importance of the right to freedom of expression. What I see as our role is to provide a check and balance. Um, and, you know, if, if a journalist has done their job properly, then I, my client won't have a case. And I really do look at it as that simple. And, um, you know, that that's the, the message that we would like to get over to them. <laughs> I've got another question. What advice would you give to students watching this webinar who may be in a similar position to what you were in at university? My key piece of advice would be get loads of work experience. And um, I've, I've probably mentioned that a few times, but I do think it is utterly crucial. Uh, I think you that is your opportunity to try out various different industries or different sectors within an industry and to get a sense of what, what appeals to you and what you think you're going to be interested in, because really the, the dream is you know that what, what i hope everybody is working towards is finding a job that they enjoy because it's going to be five sevenths minimum of your life for quite some time uh, and you know it, it can be something that is a positive rather than something that has to be endured um the other thing i would say uh, well oh, sorry tack, tack on to that one which i've already said before is you know challenge yourself um because it, 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 you'll get the most out of it if you push yourself. And the last thing would I, I would say is can, don't be afraid to speak up. Um, don't be afraid to communicate. Um, your this is this is you know your life and your working in a in an industry is or, or in a firm is a two way street. You're you're giving to them, but they also need to give back to you. Um, and, and that's how like, the most kind of uh, 
rewarding um, but successful professional relationships happen. Thank you, Helena. Let's take a look at some of the questions we have received in the live Q&A box. Uh, we have one question here which came through. Um, would you say the ever-growing prominence of the digital age and social media has led to an increase in misinformation? And how has this impacted your job? Absolutely. I, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and absolutely, I, I think that's without doubt, it has led to the increase of misinformation. Um, we, uh, there's the, currently the online harms bill going through government, um, which it seeks to deal with some of this. Um, this is kind of fake news um, or, or aspects of the bill deal with fake news. Um, the, we've also had a lot of co um, media coverage recently about Facebook and, and you know, the, what it's not doing or what it should be doing um, to, to prevent this kind of misinformation, especially in the context of um, you know, the recent pandemic and vaccinations, etc. cetera. Um, what, how, would I, how has it impacted my job? The, it is very difficult um, to bring claims, not uh, certainly not impossible, um, against in relation to misinformation, um, unless you have quite a lot of money behind you. Um, you know, you've got place companies like Twitter who are based in the United States, uh, and so certainly our laws of defamation um, are such that it is very difficult to bring a claim there because they have a law where they don't recognise. Um, most of our defamation judgments and that I think was oh. partly that was partly because um, a lot of people were coming to the England and England and suing um, Americans there and then enforcing in America and they wanted to stop to that um, so, so you know so Twitter's in the US um, Facebook's in Ireland and and you know elsewhere uh, and I, I'm Kind of these social media companies are a little bit of a law unto themselves. Um, so some, in some respects, it can be the the wild, wild west out there. Um, I mean, the, the kind of what I would say is, if anything ever happens to you or someone you know, um, the crucial thing is to act quickly. And so, if you get in touch with a lawyer as soon as you can, um, you know, my firm we run a. Uh, an inquiry called, where we were happy to you know look at things um, very quickly and if there's something we can do to help then we go from there uh, and I just think that's you know the best thing that you can do. Thank you Elena. Can you give us some tips on how to become better at attention to detail? Gosh that is a good question. <laughs> okay well um, one um, one test that we ran internally recently um, was a comparison of uh, versions of Wikipedia. Um, so people have been making updates to a page and the question was, you know, what were the updates? Um, so, you know, when were they made? And what difference did they make? Um, so, you know, you can, I guess you could test yourself on that. And similarly with articles, you'll often find that old, uh, you know, that you get different versions of articles and it will be fr from a legal perspective, the updates are going to be pretty crucial because it will change what the, you know, the, the meaning of the article. Mm -hmm. um, I guess proofreading, um, which is, uh, especially if you've just spent hours and hours on a legal assignment, um, can be incredibly difficult, but learning to be able to go through and spot, you know, with take, a, take half an hour break, come back to it with fresh eyes, and then just go through it line by line with a red pen. Thank you. Um, is self-promotion important for success, or should we wait to be found by employers? This is coming from a graphic design student. Um, I think there's a, a, a balance to be struck. Um, I think across the board, it is becoming more and more important to show uh, initi initiative and independence. Um, I think people who are prepared to kind of sit back and coast and be led are becoming less appealing in in an, a world in which actually you know it's becoming harder to succeed. So I think you do have to mark yourself out, and and that is self promotion. Um, but I also think you have to strike the right balance because you don't want to do that at you know to it 
if you're working as part of a team, for example, you also need to be able to demonstrate that you have good teamwork skills um, and not eclipse others. Um, if it's, you know, in, unless you're in a job interview, then that's fine. You can eclipse others. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think people underestimate the value of teamwork um, and it is utter, you know, utterly crucial to success in, in, in a company structure. What are major challenges you faced at the start of your career and how did you manage them? Major challenges that I faced at the start of my career. Um, I think I think probably getting used to the pace was was I, I, coming fairly fresh out of university, um, which whilst I you know was a very committed student, I was committed to both the work and the play. And then uh, I think you know met, I was working in this mental health job from nine to five. And I think, I think there came a point where I had to make a decision, which was, you know, how important is my career to me? And, uh, you know, because it, you can do fine uh, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with this um, by doing, you know, the kind of the middle ground. Or do you want to succeed? And if you want to succeed, then you have to put in, put in the extra mile and the extra effort. Uh, and once I'd made that decision, getting used to you know having to cancel plans at the last minute, um, always saying yes, putting myself out very much out of my comfort zone, um, you know, to do interviews and things like that, um, or speaking up in internal lectures, that sort of thing. I think that was kind of that was a real challenge and, and something I'm still working on, I should add. Um, it, it's a, a continuing process. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to know that you um, had those challenges, those very simple challenges like speaking up in class or in giving interviews. I mean, I, I know a lot of people are introverted. They might find it as a huge challenge, mm. huge barrier, a, a stressful scenario to overcome. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would say because not everybody is built the same way and it may be that, you know, the prospect of doing an interview makes you feel physically sick. Um, which is completely understandable. Uh, so it may be that you know there are other strengths that you can play to. The key is to identify what those are and then push them. Thank you. What are the effective ways to manage your time professionally? So I think that changes as you um, get more senior. Uh, so I think when you are a when you're junior as a paralegal or a trainee you um your time should really be managed um by your seniors so you need to communicate tell them exactly what's on your list you know what tasks you've been asked to do and they are the ones who will make the priorities for you um because really you are too junior to have a sense about what should take priority um, and also, you know, you don't want to get, you will often be working for three or four partners and you don't want to get in trouble. So you know, it's for them to make those decisions. Um, as you get a bit more senior, I think, uh, and you start running your own cases, you can, you'll, you'll have to, I tend to map out my week of, you know, what my, at the beginning of the, the week, I'll have a list of like what I need to achieve. Uh, and I'll pri prioritise that list. And at the end of the week, I'll again do the same thing about, you know, where have I got to? Is there anything else that needs to um, be, that can't wait until the following week? Um, the other thing that becomes a, a, a sort of extra demand on your time is you need to start incorporating business development. And again, I think that probably applies cross industry and it's not just a, a legal point. Um, and that, I think, you know, that really, you start thinking about that, I would say, you know, a couple of years into your career, start off with writing articles, um, you know, find, you may have to do that in your, outside your working hours. Um, it's, it depends, you know, or if you find, you know, that that's in our in our area where it's cyclical if you find that you've suddenly got a day where you haven't got so much to do then that's that's when you focus on that stuff 
Okay. How realistic are courtroom drama series like How to Get Away with Murder or Suits? These are two TV series. Um, yeah. <laughs> is it really that intense or do you also have boring days like the rest of us? Um, I certainly have boring days like the rest of you. Uh, I, don't, uh, I haven't watched the first one, but I have watched almost all of Suits. Uh, and I, well, caveat, I'm not an American lawyer, so it might be different over there. But uh, in my experience, it's not like that at all. I mean, well, firstly, you would never get uh, an individual practicing as a lawyer who hadn't actually got a practicing certificate or done yes. a law degree. Um, but secondly, I, I think actually it is a probably common misconception about lawyers that you need to have an encyclopedic knowledge of the law, which you just, you don't. I mean, you obviously, it, it's helpful to have kind of gateway or, or trigger things that make you go, oh yes, I remember that case. But then you go back and look it up and then that's the whole point of legal research and you'll go down these avenues. Um, the idea of kind of walking into your opponent's office and slamming something down on, on the desk and being like, you know, ha ha. <laughs> it's um, not, not that realistic. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What is the scope of international what's the scope of international lawyer in UK after completion of SQE exam? I'm not sure. sure. Um I I'm not sure I follow sure. the question. Um yeah, I it's, think it's a bit unclear as well. Um but it's um so whoever sent the question, could you resend the question please? Could you rephrase the question and send it to us? and we'll come back to it again. Um, let's go on to the next question. How has the legal landscape changed since you started in the field? So since I started, um, we had the introduction of the Defamation Act 2013, which was actually brought in in 2014, confusing me, uh, which was brought in, um, this is probably only interesting to media lawyers specifically, um, but, but it, it, it introduced some new hurdles which were intended to make it more difficult for claimants to bring claims, and in some respects it's managed that. Um, it has also increased, I think, a quite a lot of complexity to the law, um, which in, has resulted in more work for lawyers, which, um, depending which way you look at it, is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, the Generally speaking, I think um, there have been changes to the funding regime, which uh, the means that, I, well, we have something called no win, no fees, and um, this is quite technical, so stop me if it's boring. Um, no, but we, we have law students who are, who are watching this webinar series, so it's technically Great. of interest. So no win, no fees. Are, um, you, you, the way they used to work is that you wouldn't charge your client until, um, unless and until you won the case. And at what, that point, you would charge the full amount of fees that you would have charged as if it was a normal case, so 100% of those fees, plus a success fee. And that that success fee would be anywhere up to 100 percent. So you would get potentially 200 percent of your fees. And the the reason that system was in place was it, that it allowed uh, claimants who did not have enough money to fund their own litigation um, to to uh, you know approach law firms such as mine, who would then take on this case, you know, at their own risk. Um, but, you know, with, with a potential high reward for them, and that's what made it attractive to bring these cases. And um, what it was, I, the, how we looked at it was it was a kind of way to slightly level the playing field against these big news corporations who have got you know, far more money than most of our clients do. And the law changed on that fairly recently. And so what, it, they, what they decided was that you are no longer able to recover your success fees from the other side. So I, if, if we were successful in the case, we would still win, but we would still recover 
what we would normally have charged, but that extra success fee, we could only we could only recover from our client. We wouldn't be able to charge that to our opponent, um, which makes it not impossible, but more difficult. And so I think that was a real a real change to the way the system worked. Um, did you always have an interest in law before committing to pursuing a career in the legal sector? Uh, no, <laughs> is the answer. Um, I uh, really uh, want my interest at university was history of art, and that's where I wanted to go. Um, my, I am very fortunate that I ended up doing law, and it was something that I became interested in. But it certainly wasn't. I, I didn't feel a burning desire to go into law um, until until I actually ended up in it. Um, but as I said earlier, I, my feeling is that that's no longer really a, an option for, for most people. Uh, and that's why it's so important to do work experience, because, you know, you, you try it out and then if you like it, you can build your CV so that you look attractive to prospective employers. Well, this is an interesting one. How do you maintain a work life balance when lawyers are somewhat portrayed to have to pick one or the other? Um, so I think the answer to that is going to be different across firms and across uh, industries or sectors within the industry. My, the way I approach it is that um, I work, I, I work when I have to. So on, on the days when, you know, something is urgent, we have a deadline, then I will do everything to achieve that. And, you know, if that means working late or means working on the weekends, then so be it. Um, but on the days when that I have things to do that are not so urgent, then I'm, I'm not going to break my back to finish them, um, you know, that, that evening if they can do them the next morning. And, and I think, again, this comes back to communication. You know, if I'm managing trainees who I know have worked extremely hard, um, then, you know, I, I will try and ensure that they have you know, an adequate rest period um, because otherwise you end up with people burning out yeah. um, and that's not good for anybody. And luckily we have clients, um, you know, 99% of our clients, 100% of our clients are, are, you know, are understanding um, you know, if something's urgent, we will get it done. Uh, and if something can wait till tomorrow, it can wait till tomorrow. Amazing. Could you please explain the case you are the most proud of and why that one? Um, that's a good question. Um, Wow. Oh, okay. You've really floored me there. <laughs> um, so the case that I am most proud of is probably um, one of the cases I think that's actually been referred to in the, in the questions, um, which was uh, two individuals um, who were just, you know, your run of the mill off the street, you know, absolutely had no they were they weren't public people they weren't celebrities they weren't politicians you know they had no public profile at all and um, they just you know did normal jobs and you know i think they were one of them was a teacher and uh the other one i think worked in the nhs and uh they got caught up in a media storm um i won't go into the details of particularly why because it was a privacy case but um stories about them and their relationship went viral and then got picked up in the national media and um, were published by the mirror and the daily mail and lad bible and somewhere else and they were not only kind of deeply offensive but deeply intrusive for these people who were just completely normal and you know their lives got complete upheaval complete and um, you know, to, to the extent that, you know, they, they really, really suffered um, and had to undergo, you know, therapy um, to, to kind of recover from this quite traumatic experience. And the, we, they came to us and um, I successfully, we sued all four of the newspapers and managed to get them a six figure settlement, which um, it was a life changing amount of money for them. Uh, and while it doesn't, you know, wipe the slate clean 
it did take off, you know, the, the articles came down and they had enough money to kind of start, a, start fresh. That's amazing. <laughs> and we have one final question, uh, coming slowly to the end of the time. Um, who's the most famous client you have ever represented personally? Personally? Um, well, uh, I, I mean, obviously, as I'm sure you'll understand, um, most of our clients don't like to be named publicly. Um, we have, you know, the firm has uh, represented people like Simon Cowell and Elton John, um, and that's all public knowledge. Um, I mean, yes, as I'm, our reputation, I think, precedes us. We get a lot of celebrity clients, um, but you know, for for our, our reputation is also one of discretion. <laughs> so I Understandable. <laughs> Helena, on that lovely note, thank you so much for being here with us today, for sharing your expertise and insights with us. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. And to our viewers, thank you for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed this webinar and we look forward to welcoming you back on the 24th of November, 3 p.m. GMT. Uh, for the next series of Air Cover with Mark Bell, who is the International Business Operations Director at Adobe. For more inspiration, for more information, sorry, and inspiration, <laughs> subscribe to our YouTube channel. See you soon. <laughs>